Well, good afternoon, everybody. Very, very warm welcome to Chatham House today. My name is Bernice Lee. I am the, oh, thank you. I'm the executive director for the Hoffman Center for Sustainable Resource Economy at Chatham House. So today, it is an event that we are looking at, reinventing the plastic bottle. Many people have asked me the last couple of weeks, why are you doing this event? Is plastics really a matter of international affairs? And I think the answer to all of you, that presumably you would agree, is that, well, yes, it is, because I think the world has gone a little bit plastic mad in the past couple of months and certainly past couple of years. It's gone mad in both ways, both in terms of what we produce, and I don't know whether you saw the rolling presentation, and almost every single number you look at is scary. All the numbers somehow defies imagination that we can be producing that much and wasting that much. And at the same time, we also feel that from being plastic fantastic to now plastic is evil, we are not entirely sure where the solutions really would lie when you look at the complexities of you know, the solution space. And the Hoffman Center's goal indeed is to try and figure out of all the things we could be doing in a way that meet the needs not just of our own conscience here living in a rich country, but also of those in need in poor countries. What are the different types of things we should be thinking about? So this series is really one in the series of events we're going to do. We think that we will do tackle food next time. We were thinking in June we'll look at how do we reinvent meat or burgers. In fact, ideas welcome. We want to pick one angle, not just food. We'll probably look at t-shirts um, or fashion in September alongside the London Fashion Week. So I thought what would be helpful today is just to quickly walk you through some of our thought process. So last week, as we were preparing for this meeting, we thought, well, you know, we have such a great panel of speakers that um, our moderator will introduce in a second, which I will pass the baton to him. We thought, well, there are so many things that we should be considering. Why don't we try to see whether we can draw it down in one map? So you see in the slide, the red and the gray are some of the solutions in terms of the materials. So you could be using new materials, you can be using algae or corn, or things that I can't pronounce to be making bottles that are more sustainable. You could be using, obviously, old ones, but doing them better and recycling them better. In the middle, you see the orangey bit, which is the whole kind of reduce, reuse, recycle, which, of course, is very much limited by not only infrastructure, but also the quality of the materials themselves. In tiny, tiny words at the bottom, you will see that the key variables include whether or not it's durable, is it recyclable, is it, is it energy, what's, what, what is its energy potential? Can we turn it into waste? Or can we turn it into waste to energy? Um, what is the weight? Can they be transported? And of course, price. Oil price, another that being a determining factor. At the same time, as we think through, you know, and also in the news, as you ha all have seen, are the numbers that we were also doing in the role, which is how much of the plastics waste have been shipped to China. And in some ways, when China announced that they don't want to take it anymore, we are kind of realizing, oh, actually, you know, we need to tackle them ourselves. But it also brings to the front, I think, you know, plastic is not just a matter of materials, it's not just a matter of our waste, but it's also, for others, a matter of having safe drinking water in some parts of the world. And if, indeed, municipal solid waste problem is one of the major contributors, not from yesterday, from about 30 to 40 years ago, causing diseases, causing all sorts of problems, perhaps it's time for us to find solutions that not only tackle problems that we have today, which is that of waste, that of, that of single-use plastic, but also look at how do we make sure that any solutions we come up with also all that end up with a positive outcome for those in more need of, for example, safe drinking water than we do. Now, last but not least, in, in blue are the policy question. That, you know, we think of policy often as regulation, but policy could be about information campaigns. It could be about setting the right pricing structure. It could also be about making sure that the right kind of infrastructure gets invested so that we get to the kind of solution selection <coughs> that we, we know we will need for this problem to be tackled. So today, with great honor, I want to introduce Jan Petrovsky. Um, you guys thought that you're getting Roger Harabin, but Roger Harabin from the BBC got sick today. So very last minute, if I may add, um, Jan Petrovsky, who you might have seen his article last week in The Economist, he's written a very long article in The Economist on plastics. He very gallantly uh, agreed to step in last minute. So we have now Jan Petrovsky, the environment correspondent from The Economist, who will be moderating our session today. Thank, Thank you. you. Very 
good evening, uh, good evening all. Um, as uh, Bernie said, I was roped in at the last minute, so uh, forgive my sartorial choices. Um, I, uh, I'm sure we'll have a, a very good discussion, but before we begin the discussion, um, I will first of all, we'll introduce the, the speakers, and then each of them in turn will give short uh, five minute presentations, um, five minute presentations, and then we will we'll kick off the discussion. So uh, we'll start with Tom Domen, who's the head of um, long-term innovation, as opposed to short-term innovation, I suppose, um, at Ecover. Um, then we have Pierre Pazlier, who is a co-founder and co-chief executive of Skipping Rocks Lab, um, and they make uh, plastics out of plants and seaweeds. Apparently, you can eat some of them. Um, then we have Tony Breton, who, is, uh, uh, who comes from uh, Novamont. Uh, and we have Neil Dunn, the chief executive of uh, Polymateria. And finally, uh, Saskia Restoric, who is the director of the Hubbub Foundation. Um, and she'll be talking a little bit about uh, what, uh, you know, how we can change our behavior with regard to uh, litter and plastics. So why don't we, without further ado, get started with, uh, with five minutes from Tom. Good evening. Uh, yes, I'm Tom, work for Ecofair. Um, we make ecological washing and cleaning products. And actually Ecofair was founded about 25 years ago um, out of concern of impact of everyday products on water quality. Of course, in our case, it was soap, detergent. Um, and if you think about those products, by definition, they go down the drain into the water. Um, so uh, what we noticed at the time is that uh, actually the products that were made weren't designed to go into the water. There were issues with biodegradability, issues with, with toxicity. And those issues aren't that different from, I guess, the problems we know with plastics today as well. Um, so we focused 30 years or more really on finding safer chemistry, um, more environmental chemistry, of course, on the product inside a bottle. Um, but we were also one of the companies that were, got the first early warning signals about the impact of plastics on water, because we were so much engaged in the whole uh, water quality discussion. And, and this was for, for us a kind of wake-up call that next to, of course, focus on, on the product inside the bottle, actually, as a company, we need to take responsibility for the packaging around the product. Uh, and it was for us the start of a journey, and it's a journey that is still ongoing to find better solutions for uh, the packaging we know today. And, and I'll give you a kind of uh, overview of, of the different things we did as a company in, in the packaging arena. The journey actually started with uh, our ocean bottle uh, more than, than five to six years ago, where we did first test on can we kind of convert litter, litter that we collected in the North Sea to help a fisherman into new packaging, um, which we did at the time. It was a journey that was quite tough to do. We had to work with recyclers, with bottle manufacturers, with, with material experts to get that first product on the market. Um, and we did an ocean bottle every year, again, based on litter, uh, turned into new packaging. Um, but this, we realized quickly that this ocean bottle was, was definitely just kind of symbol um, for us to address real issues and we start working in the background on more fundamental systemic solutions for, for packaging and, and sustainable packaging. Um, and so we worked on three big uh, tracks. And the first track is, is the whole issue around recyclability and using recycled content. We were using 25% recycled content at the time, but we wanted to prove that it is possible to create a packaging without any virgin material at all. So. A couple of weeks ago, actually, um, we launched our first standard bottle based on 100% post-consumer recycled content. So all material that was once used by a consumer was collected and reprocessed into a new bottle. And again, this was a tough journey to find good quality um, at plastic um, and, and, and turn it actually into a nice and beautiful bottle. The second um, track we worked on is, is the whole refill, reuse. If you think there's a solution there as well, how can you make consumers reuse packaging more than once? Especially if it's made out of plastic, our bottles and triggers and caps can last for more than 50 times. Um, and, and actually people only use it once. So why is that? Why isn't there more infrastructure around refill? As Ecover we introduced refill systems 20 years ago, but again, the actual um, it's, only pre it's only available in, in like a few health food stores and we haven't managed to roll that program out further. And hence we're kind of looking into how can we kind of 
make refill available to all consumers? Uh, and what's stopping consumers from actually going to refill? And then the third one um, is around reinventing the material itself. Using a material like plastic that, is, that nature is basically unable to process for something that's only used once, it's kind of fundamentally wrong to us as well as kind of design challenge. Uh, and, and we wanted to fundamentally look at that challenge as well. Um, so we started to work with many different companies, many different partners on reinventing the material, uh, getting to a material that we call like no harm material. So whatever it ends up, it needs to be harmless, whether it ends up in a recycling stream, whether it ends up uh, in a landfill or whether it ends up in the ocean. Basically nature needs to be able to deal with that. Local organisms need to be able to deal with that without any toxic, toxic effects, without persistency effects. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Pierre Pazlier. Hi, so um, I'm the co-founder of a, a London startup uh, called Keeping Rocks Lab. And um, our goal is to make packaging disappear. And I think what you said was really resonates with um, our, our mission. Um, I think there's, there's a few insights when we started this company that um, uh, link quite well to reinventing the, the, the plastic bottle. And when you think about that material that is so precious and so uh, performant like plastic, um, doesn't make any sense to use it for, for single use. Uh, but single use is part of our lives and that's something that is very uh, convenient that now is a requirement for, for many uh, of like our activities. So rather than um, uh, trying to um, re, uh, like push plastic into a better recycling system or uh, a better reuse, we decided to really embrace the fact that single use is still possible with other materials. And so we started to uh, look at natural materials, abundant materials, um, and uh, we started to produce uh, uh, our products out of an extract from seaweed. And um, our products are slightly different than a plastic bottle. They're really focused on uh, instant consumption. Uh, and they're more like bubbles, but we think that uh, they have a, a really good uh, uh, use in a lot of places where you consume plastic in less than five minutes. Um, so we've created those bubbles that are made from this uh, seaweed material. And we thought that what a better way to show how harmless a material can be than if you make it edible. So cheers. <laughs> we, we had that for our launch. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously that's, uh, that's something that is uh, like pushing the material further than maybe is required for uh, packaging, but that's also a statement that we can use naturals, mater natural materials that do a, a really good job at packaging if you think of them as like, uh, like their own set of constraints. And one of the big problem with uh, plastic bottles is that uh, the whole infrastructure is built around their manufacturing technology. So you have like big factories that are producing for an entire country. Then you have to ship those like pre-packaged bottles in trucks, et cetera. And that like just leads to the system that we have now. Our material can be transformed in a very small a machine, kind of like the size of a coffee machine. So it means that you can actually package things directly on the go, on the spot where it's going to be served. So if you think of a, a marathon or a festival, you don't have to transport pre-packaged bottles uh, all the way to that event and then collect them and bring them back somewhere else. You can just produce everything on the spot. Um, and as a result, that means that we can have a material where the, um, the shelf life of the product inside matches the shelf life of the packaging. And that's really important. That's kind of what, what we call the, the shelf life gap. It doesn't make sense to put a cold pressed juice that's going to expire in two days in a bottle that takes 700 years to decompose. So if you can kind of like shrink that to have a material that matches the use, then you can actually tackle a certain part of the market uh, in a much more efficient way. And I think that's really where um, like the, the future uh, like will lead us. We have to look at applications. There's not going to be a bottle that fits the same market for supermarkets and festivals. You're going to have to differentiate th those products and you're going to have to use the best available material from nature to do the job. And I think like uh, one comment as well is that there's materials that are so abundant that we should just use them. Um, seaweed, some of the seaweed that we use 
grows up to three meters per day. So that's the fastest growing material on this planet. So we should, we should, we should just use those materials rather than like digging through the earth to find precious oil. And I think that um, there's gonna be a lot more natural materials that are going to replace plastic for specific niche applications and that's quite exciting. Okay. Thank you, Pierre. Um, and now we have Tony. Hi, back here. Um, I'm, hi, I'm Tony. Um, I come from a company called Novamont, and uh, we promote a, the development of a bioeconomy model which is based on the kind of efficient use of renewable resources and the regeneration of a local area. Um, by regeneration, um, I'm talking about local areas, I'm talking about how can we actually form, re rejuvenate the industries which have left the territories in which we're in. Um, how can we recommission, decommission sites? How can we make old facilities recompetitive again? Um, and more importantly, how can we link the products to the system and bring back jobs which have, are currently being lost through, through the supply chains that we now have? So for us, it's not just about producing um, a low-impact product. It's about anybody, not anybody, but obviously, you can, it's quite simple relatively to produce a, a low-impact product. It's more about what, what is the model of economy that we're looking at and how can we improve using those models to improve the citizens' quality of life and it, within that engender the cultural change that we need in order to make the system that we all actually want to work. So when it comes to, to plastic and the consumption of plastic bottles and, and plastic packaging, a lot of it is currently being driven by urbanization, health concerns, groundwater contamination, and the quality and availability of water. But when you look at the, the, a lot of the use of the plastic packaging and f uh, drinks packaging, it's underpinned by soil. Water goes through soil. Runoff from rivers goes through soil. Food comes from soil. And soil is our, basically our ignored natural resource, and the UN calls it humanity's silent ally. So beyond, beyond what soil is, does for you for water and for food, it's a major regulator when it comes to CO2 and the storage of carbon. So we need to protect our soils from chemical and physical degradation, from microplastics, but what we can also do is replenish our soils at the same time as we are looking at using them. Uh, as looking at the EU, we have 100 million tonnes of bio-waste a year, which puts the 78 million tonnes of plastic packaging globally in, into perspective. We have 100 million tonnes of bio-waste. Much of that, our food and um, our food comes in plastic. That food is coming as, as that bio-waste. So we, we believe we should have a system whereby the packaging that you are using for that food and that bio-waste which is therein can then be properly recycled back to the soil. So the, the composting, the organic industries, they don't want traditional plastic packaging, but by the same extent, the traditional plastic recyclers, they don't want the food residues which are being stuck in these containers. And as, as an organization and a company, this is, this is how we all started. In fact, if you go back further, we, we're seen as a biochemical company today. If you go back deep into the roots of the company, we are one of the companies who were invented and commercialized polypropylene. So we, 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 we know plastics. But back in 1992, in northern Italy, the landfill suddenly shut. There was a waste crisis. Nobody knew what to do. And they looked at what they had and they realized, and this is the same for the majority of urban waste across the globe, the dominating um, component of that waste stream was bio-waste, be it food waste and garden waste. So that they said, right, let's reshape our <coughs> complete waste system so that the, the bio-waste comes out clean and goes into organic recycling. By taking the bio-waste out, it makes all the other recycling easier. It makes the consumer more confident about how they can recycle. It gives them clean materials to work with. So we looked at focusing our efforts on producing materials and products, it, pr materials to go into applications which can improve the collection of bio-waste. Um, within the, within this, you need the system that works. You need the vision and you need the, the complete collaboration across the shareholder, uh, across the supply chains. At the moment, we're basically pushing up a hill because the, the existing supply chains don't want to know change. They think, we, we can do it all. We can just add a bit more recycling. We can tinker around the edges. Basically, we need a fundamental shift in the way the whole of the, the waste management and the resource systems work. So for us, local production, uh, particularly in the bioeconomy, it's not just the sensible thing to do, it's a necessity. So by linking chemistry, organic waste, agriculture, plastics, the environmental enhancement that we can all have, re-industrialization, and we need leadership at all levels. 
But th these kind of visions only are achievable, in our view, through industri the industrial adoption of vertically integrated chains, in which linking, for at least for our sectors, low impact agriculture with commercial solutions. The solutions need to be coming from clean tech, and they need to serve the common goals together. We cannot just work in one specific area, they need, it needs a wider vision. We're coming back, finally, to the, the title of the, of, of the session, which is Reinventing the Plastic Bottle. As I said, one of our, one of our goals and one of the things we do is reindustrialization and recommissioning. Last year, at this, um, we took over, for the first time, full control of a 100,000 ton um, polyester plant. That polyester plant was producing PET for PET bottles in Italy. That plant is now using the local jobs, the local infrastructure, and the local skills to, to serve the bioeconomy <coughs> of Italy. So our message is the bioeconomy is not just a dream, it's, it's a reality, and it just needs an accelerator. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Neil? Thanks. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, Jan, and also thanks, uh, Bernice, for inviting me back. You're, you always know you've said something right or done something right when you're invited back to present um, at, a, at a session like this. And when I was walking out earlier, I was just reflecting on the last time I was here, which was the opening of the Hoffman Center. And I think um, the wall ended just where that partition is. So I think it's probably a statement of the fact that you are um, running a very successful uh, enterprise here, but also that this particular issue draws everybody in. It draws people in in a way that in the time I've been working in sustainability, I've not seen it capture the public mindset in a way where The Economist, National Geographic, The Daily Mail, The Telegraph, every NGO um, are all actually mobilizing this on a way that I've, I've frankly, it's, it's so refreshing. But on the other side of it, of the equation, the supply side solutions are so few and, and far between. Um, and the kind of systems level change that, that, that Tony was talking about there is absolutely essential. But coming back to the last time I was on this stage here, another lady was on the stage called Lawrence Tubiana. She's one of the 12 people in the world who can probably claim credit for the positive outcome we got on climate action in 2015. And it's worth reflecting as you think about plastic as an issue, not just the bottle, but actually the billion ton problem that that's gonna be per annum over the course of our lifetimes, what it was that we did in Paris that allowed us to be successful. The first thing was the science was developed at a level that was beyond reproach. I know some people did challenge it and it was presented as an equal, equal debate in some parts of the media, not the economist, but some parts of the media presented it like a, an equal debate. But having that scientific rigor and peer-reviewed work where we could all actually open source the assumptions that we were making, evolve our understanding of scope one, two, three emissions, how it, how it um, pertained to different industries, um, that allowed us to have a, a common ground and a robust conversation around what would work and what wouldn't work. The second thing was we engaged markets based on the capital cost of solving that particular problem. And the thing that allowed us to do that was the cost curve abatement methodology, which actually Tony Blair uh, commissioned when he was in uh, government back in 2008, 2009. And it allowed us to look at everything in its own swim lane. You could look at the capital cost of implementing a particular solution and you could weigh up carbon capture and storage, clean coal, solar, wind, EVs, everything and put them all together. So markets could engage on the back of having that scientific rigor and excellence and then we could mobilize industry. Then we could actually mobilize industry, not where we need them to be in 10 years or 15 years, but actually where they're at today. So to come back to this um, this problem, this not just the bottle, but the billion ton problem that this is emblematic of, there's a whole industry out there, plastic supply chains that have many of the same players who again eventually engage positively with Paris, BP, Total and others at the back end, refining and creating product that ultimately then flows downstream. They have no idea that this issue is actually um, something that we are, we are as concerned about. They all get that environmental action is something that they want to, that they want to address. But what, where the capital costs and industries that run at 1%, 2% margin, how we can actually fund the retooling of an entire value chain to make things more circular, to embrace a circular economy, who's going to fund that and pay for that unless we have a common logic and a way of relating it to things that markets can engage on, we, we just can't even bring them in. We can't even draw them into the conversation today. So that's where I'm going to put 
a controversial idea out, which is that plastic is not the enemy that we think it is. The issue with plastic is the end of life phase. Plastic does a huge amount of good in the world in terms of its ability to preserve food, to conserve it, to prolong the shelf life of products that we'd be otherwise just, just throwing into landfill. We have a design flaw in plastic, which is that it's not in harmony with the most powerful circular economy we have, which is that of nature. So when we design any industrial product, we need to design for leakage. We need to ultimately design it in a way where it will wind up in the natural environment at a, at a point in time. And that's why biodegradability biodegrada is so important, because the um, products that you're putting into recycling facilities need to be able to biodegradate. The um, bioplastics need to be able to de degrade. Um, and, and anything that winds up as fugitive outside of that system needs to degrade as well. And unless we're actually fully able to um, assimilate plastic within, within nature, um, you, you, you get the issues that we've got, which are well documented by Ellen MacArthur and everybody else who's doing a lot of the awareness raising in this space. And you can then get to the inevitable conversation around who funds it, what have we got on the shelf today, what do we need medium term, and what do we, what do we ultimate, ultimately need long term. So to, to, I think, you know, relate that back to, to the, the particular issue of the, of the plastic bottle, I think it's only through integrity in the science and building coalitions that will actually draw in first that scientific community, get them much better at sharing their work and the research that has been done, then engaging NGOs and capital uh, costs of the solutions to get us to a point where we can all have um, a common discussion around what needs to happen for a second and third. So I know when Jan leans forward, it's usually time to wrap up. But um, what, I do, what I do want to what I do want to say, kind of finally, just 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 before before closing off, is that there is um, tremendous potential in actually being able to change the nature of polymers themselves, so that they can be much more in harmony with the biosphere. And one of the things that really drew me into the to the role that I'm in now, leading polymateria is looking under a microscope and actually seeing through technology we've developed how bacteria are attacking the polymer chains to the point where they can be properly broken down and the molecular, the molecular weight can be small enough that um, enzymes can ultimately d deal with it, so you're left with nothing but carbon and water. So I think the potential for technology with lower capital costs to start solving the problem based on where industry are at today are, is incredibly exciting. We need to be able to put everything in their own swim lane and look at capital costs and LCA of everything. You're leaning really far forward. Um, is, 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 I think, you know, one, of the, one of the great things that hopefully will be a legacy from this session here today. Right. Thank you. Um, and last but not least. Uh, last but not least, Saskia. Thank you. I'm from Hubbub, um, which is a charity, an environmental charity that creates positive, playful campaigns inspiring people to make greener, healthier lifestyle choices. And we specialise in communicating environmental messages to a mainstream audience. And I'm here to talk about the customer's point of view, the sort of the person on the street uh, from a behaviour change perspective. And now, as we've heard, over the last year or so in the UK, plastic bottles have gone from being part of everyday life to being public enemy number one. And public anger has been quick to rise and condemn plastic bottles, but public behaviour hasn't changed significantly. So that value action gap, the gap between what a person says or thinks is important to them and how they actually behave, is bigger than ever. And this value action gap makes people feel guilty uh, and uncomfortable. But without an easy way to change that behaviour, that guilt just sits there. Um, and I think that this combination of public anger about the problem and the desire to change in this guilt creates actually a real opportunity for a bigger and bolder level of change, uh, an opportunity to change things more dramatically than perhaps we normally could. So starting at the top of the waste hierarchy, can we reduce the number of single-use bottles? Well, a small number of people do make the effort to take their refillable bottle for water or other products. Um, and projects like Refill Bristol, which have really helped uh, make it easier, make it more of a normal thing to do to go into a shop and ask for a refill, um, can really help to, to make that a more of a widespread norm. Um, and if we do persuade lots more people to use refillable bottles, fantastic. But 
there's still a huge number of drinks that aren't water, things which can't be refilled. The trend for, for uh, consuming food and drink on the go is rising faster and faster. Um, so I think we can definitely make some inroads there, but we will need to be using disposable bottles for the foreseeable future. So should we focus on circularity, uh, ensuring that plastic bottles are made from 100% recycled content and that we recycle as much as possible? Um, I think the figure we have is we're recycling something like 37.9% of plastic waste in the UK, which is a pretty, pretty rubbish amount, really. Um, so we need to look at re-ramping that up. Um, is it something like uh, a deposit return scheme? There's information about, out there about that at the moment. Uh, the government's considering it. We'll see where that goes. We know there are problems with infrastructure. There simply aren't enough bins. We were talking to some young people in Bristol just the other day saying, you know, why is it that you drop your bottle on the ground or you don't recycle it? And they just said, well, there aren't any bins. It's literally not a recycling bin anywhere that we know where to put it. Uh, so there's definitely a problem with lack of infrastructure. Even if we collected it all in, uh, we've heard about the problems with China refusing to take our, our plastic recycler because it's too contaminated. Um, so there's a, a real problem there. We need to look at the whole system-wide um, uh, issues there. And new materials, a lot of people here are looking at obviously new materials, and I think it's, we all know we need to look at the full life cycle, make sure that there are no unintended negative social or environmental consequences. Um, and particularly that the end product works with the existing um, infrastructure that we actually have. There's no point creating a wonderful new material if it can't be disposed of by our existing infrastructure or if it cons confuses consumers and so they end up disposing it in the wrong place and it goes to landfill anyway. Um, different types of plastic are causing huge amounts of confusion as to what people should do. Uh, and how are consumers likely to respond to new materials? Well, we know that people are resistant to change um, and getting people to change ingrained habits is especially hard. To have a chance of mainstream success, any new product has to work as well or better than the thing it's replacing. They need to make our lives easier, uh, not harder, and they need to fit in with our existing lifestyle. And they also need to be seen as aspirational, not prohibitive or downgrading in any way. From an environmental point of view, the new material must, of course, be underpinned by strong evidence-based life cycle analysis, etc. But for the average consumer, a plastic bottle is merely a container for a drink or, or another product. It's not a high-value investment. And so for the majority, the eco-credentials matter way less than just does it do its job, does it make sure, making sure it doesn't spill or split, that it looks and feels right, uh, and that it's easy to dispose of properly. We've done some research recently into coffee cups, another big uh, topical issue, asking customers whether they would bring a refillable coffee cup in return for a big discount, uh, plus a small levy, which has been talked about a lot. Um, and the majority of people agreed that the number of coffee cups uh, that don't get recycled is awful. It's a big problem. Something should be done. Um, and they all said, yep, this sounds like a great idea. Um, I'm sure lots of people will do that, but probably not me. Um, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I probably would forget my cup or, or I don't really want to carry around a dirty cup after I've used it. So these people said they would not, they would most likely would not bring their own cup despite a strong financial incentive, a big understanding of the environmental problem, mostly because it's too much hassle. We've had a much better response to our campaign to introduce coffee cup recycling in the square mile. We have a high profile communications campaign, and lots of easy to use bins um, on the streets or in offices where people tend to bring their coffee. This was a big collaboration bringing together retailers, waste management companies, local employers, the local authority. And we managed to recycle half a million cups in the first month. So, finishing. Um, I think the public anger and guilt to combined about the plastic problem represents a really big opportunity to do something big and bold. Um, I think we can't obviously solve the plastic bottle problem in isolation without looking at the wider issues around packaging and particularly around waste disposal and recycling infrastructure and consumer behaviours altogether. Um, so designing a new packaging or a new product, it has to be about collaboration, working with the waste management industry, with local authorities, with retailers and with consumers uh, to make sure that the product isn't just recyclable, but it is actually recycled in the right way. So perhaps it's not just a plastic bottle that needs rethinking, but the whole design process. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. I'll, I'll use my prerogative as, as moderator to ask a, 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 the first question. Um, 
and it's basically to any any one of you on, on the panel is is welcome to uh, to jump in. But my my question is: Do we really need to reinvent the plastic bottle? Uh, somewhat prov provocative, but when you think about it, the pl plastic bottles are main, mainly made of two polymers, right? PET and HDPE. Those two polymers are particularly sort of easy to recycle into high quality materials. They are relatively easy to sort. They are not as contaminated as many other things. So in fact, they're just about the most recyclable stuff that we have. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, is there that, that much point uh, putting resources and all this energy into reinventing the plastic bottle rather than focusing maybe on other parts of the cycle uh, or, or other products which may present a bigger problem. Anybody want to jump in? Tom? Yeah, well, um, I, th I think in the, like you said, uh, plastic bottles are probably the best recyclable item that you can find currently today. Um, and their reality shows indeed that uh, actually they aren't being recycled properly. Um, so it kind of proves the point indeed that recycling is a perfect system in theory. In, in reality, in practical reality, it's not functioning properly. Um, now indeed we can respond in, in two ways to that. Either we try to fix recycling as a, as a, as a system, either we say, okay, we're never gonna change that system, so we change to a new system. I think both answers for me are valid. Uh, I think we don't have like the final answer yet. I think there is still potential in trying to solve recycling industry, trying to fix recycling industry today, uh, and with the opportunity of China refusing waste and, and, and people getting engaged, there might be an opportunity to look into that area. But at the same time, we might never be able to fix recycling industry. So I do think indeed, like some examples that have been shown here, do provide a good alternative to that, to that system, even for something like a plastic bottle. So I, I, I think we need our hero products. I think, I think we need a lightning rod that we can kind of all point to and say, because we fixed that, everything else can follow. So, so Nike, many of you know, was a kind of a circular economy leader. And Hannah Jones, who did the CSO role, sorry, still does the CSO role there, said, give me the cross trainer, which is the toughest product to make margin on. It's the one that has the most amount of functional design that goes into it and the, the you know, the, the, the least amount of margin. And said, if I can actually properly solve for the cross trainer, then I have the right to go to everybody else in apparel. And, uh, you know, that's where the, the, the kind of the momentum on the circular economy came from within the business. So I really think as we approach this problem, we need a hero product. We need to find our, our Tesla, um, something that allows us to kind of, you know, really point and say it costs in. So I think this is one of the key things that <clears throat> we need to have very honest conversations about, which is, can it cost in and can it scale? And when it scales, can you consider full LCA? So how many um, so you oceans of so you, oceans so you don't of want water? It to be a Tesla. What? So you don't want it to be a Tesla. Well, I, it's a, it's they're a, having significant scaling problems. They are. They they. But that's the Gigafactory, and I think once they get their Gigafactory on stream, I mean, I'm I'm an optimist, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that by solving one thing where we can get it to cost in and it can scale, and when you look at the full. LCA analysis of that particular solution, that it just beats everything else. That gives us the right to go to all other forms of packaging and all other um, um, types of um, polymers and to, to you know, really challenge them on why it isn't happening. I, I, would, I would disagree in the sense that I think that uh, we've been a bit lazy and we've been using plastic for everything. And I think that we can do better than this. And I think the essential problem with plastic is, well, first of all, where does it come from? And it's like a non-renewable -re resource. There's a lot of work, but I mean, you don't want to like take from like our food, re food resource. You don't want to have like the problem of like scaling up from something that might be uh, like non-renewable. Um, how much energy does actually go into transforming that product? And I think that there is an opportunity for materials that take way less CO2 energy and so on in like actually making products out of like the raw material. And obviously the end of life, you have to design for leakage. You have to design for those like items that will end up in the sea. And so I think that um, when you have uh, an honest look at like which product requires all of the wonderful attributes of plastic and which don't, you have a much clearer way to like 
to assess whether you can reduce plastic for this category and you can use plastic for the things that really needs hundreds of years of shelf life and need like that much barrier properties, et cetera. So there is a bit of a, like, of, of uh, like taking a step back and saying, okay, let's just use it for what it's really good at and let's try to find alternatives where, where it's better. Very nice. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whether or not we will end up reinventing the plastic bottle. But what I think this conversation so far inspires is the idea that we need to do things horses for courses. And indeed, I mean, you know, if Paris was the example, um, we have the idea there that poor countries should do less at the beginning. So perhaps, you know, focusing on poor countries' use of disposable plastic without thinking about investing in the infrastructure of recycling would be silly. But perhaps there are some people who should still use them in a way that perhaps in some cases, like myself, there's no particular reason to use them, at least for water, if nothing else. And I think if we start thinking horses for courses, whether or not the ingenuity, the innovation will go in, end up becoming a new bottle or in other materials, I'm not sure I worry about that. But right now, as I think Saskia said, if we can't tap into this anger and guilt, and I have so many friends who gave up plastic for January, and I just thought, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? You know, what are you, where are you gonna buy food from? It's really, really difficult. But to make us think about it before we do, which I think is already an important step, and then with all the innovators, all the thinking around your materials, we may well end up somewhere else that we didn't think we will be in the first place. So with that, I think whether or not we end up inventing it or not, I'm not sure that's a relevant question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tony? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say whether we, whether we actually re need to reinvent uh, the plastic bottle as a format, uh, we should certainly be looking in the longer term to decouple plastic as a, as a material from fossil fuel consumption. So whether you're doing that through the use of bio-based materials or whether you're doing that through improving the circularity within the bottle, and there's an awful lot that you can do to improve the circularity of the bottle. For one, you could get the brands to say we don't necessarily need a, a water bottle to be clear. Um, that would, would soon and get the marketing teams to actually put that as a, as a benefit to improve the recycled content and drive the recycling from the consumer side. You then need the, the actual recycling system and plastics to work. You, you say uh, there's a basically two materials. Trust me, there, there's probably 15 types of PET. And that's before you get into the PPs and the HDPEs. And if, when you look at all the different colors and all the different things that go into them, um, what you need when you're presenting a drink is food contact. And that, that needs to be very clear, very, very high quality, s assured for the public safety. Um, so if you're mixing shampoo bottles in your collection, with um, detergents, with hazardous waste materials, and drinks bottles, you need a, a system which works. And so for that, with the, for instance, with the Alan MacArthur Foundation, they're doing a project called um, Holy Grail, and it is a bit like the Holy Grail, whereby they're looking to develop a, a system whereby uh, there's a tracer slash marker system, which is non-permanent, non uh, based probably on water, where you could put your any plastic, any material, with any traceability through a sorting system, and it would ping it to the right system. And then, then you've got the brands are able to basically buy their own bottles back. So if you can start with that, um, I, I, I would also just question, I was looking at this last night, uh, where, where's this consumption come from? Because uh, when I was little, and I'm not that old, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I grew up on a little island, but I did question in, in the early 80s, why, why, is, why are we having water in bottles? And I looked it up last night. In the UK, we, in the 80s, we drank 30, well, we consumed 30 million litres of water in bottles. <laughs> last year, it was 3.6 or 3.2 billion litres. What's happened? Um, where's all this water? Where's this need for water? What, what, where's it all coming from? And if we can look at the, the motivations behind that, sorry, the brands who are selling water bottles, um, but this is part of the whole system. The consumption is not necessarily the best way of doing it. So whether it's water pipes and, and water taps and those kind of systems, we need a combination of solutions for it. Shall I just let uh, Saskia uh, chip in if you want, and then we will we'll ha move to the floor? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think. Um it's a very good question. Do we actually need to rethink the bottle itself, or is it that more the system that, that needs looking at? Uh, and you've just given a great example of 15 different types of plastic. How are people supposed to know what earth can be recycled and can't? Exactly, exactly. So, but it, clearly, it's going to take a huge amount of political will, a huge investment uh, in, in facilities, sort of on the ground, as, as well as um, you know, manufacturers and, and producers and everyone kind of coming together. So, it's back to my point about collaboration. If we can get everyone to do that, then, then, then that would be, um, well, part of the holy grail anyway, I think. There's, there's a, an interesting startup in Chile. Um, they, they work in Chile and in Brazil. Uh, it's called Triciclos. 
and they, uh, they basically man the recycling bins with a rag picker who knows his plastics in and out. So whenever a consumer comes to try and to dump their, their stuff, the, the rag picker helps with the sorting. He gets compensated for it, and then you get you know, very well sorted, uh, very well, well sorted waste. Which, um, which I mean, obviously, it might be a little bit trickier in, in rich countries with, with high labor costs. But in, in, in the developing world or in, in middle income countries like like Chile and Brazil, it seems to be certainly an interesting initiative. All right, we'll um, we'll move to the floor. Um, I'll take uh, about three questions at a time. Um, please, when you, uh, when you ask the questions, could you please say who you are and where you're from? Uh, could we start with um, maybe the lady here? Amelia Womack, Deputy Leader of the Green Party. Um, I think it's really interesting that the number of different things that come as a result of this debate. I've actually done a week plastic free, which was nothing, but it did really start to make you reimagine about how we can do things. Um, I've got a number of, of lists of things that you can, you can actually change. But one of the things that came back to me constantly was the changing cost and things like method and ECOVA not being accessible to everyone as a result, result of those cost limits. Um, and I think that one of the important parts is this idea of how we reimagine products. And given that we didn't really have, we didn't have plastics in this way 100 years ago, it's really interesting how our societies become so addicted to them. And even basic things like having bars of soap and as um, companies like Lush are pushing for bars of shampoo and bars of conditioner, is there really a way that we can reimagine these products so that there isn't plastic in them at all, which probably reflects back on a time, I mean, the, 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 when I remember, as most of you here will, when plastic soap came, when soap started to come in plastic bottles and it was, um, people started to replace their bar soaps, it wasn't that long ago that we start, began to do that. But also it's the systems that need reimagining. And um, I work across the country with our councillors and our members. And in York, our councillors are championing a new way of looking at the plastic cup. Uh, sorry, looking at the cup I'm and saying good. that um, if we have a deposit scheme that isn't about um, where you return a cup so it can be cleaned and you always get a fresh cup, or you are able to um, keep that cup and wash it at home, that actually there's a whole other system that we can create if we're not just continuing the models that we already have. Uh, do, you have do you have a question? <laughs> so the question was about reimagining products and how um, we, um, so how we meet the costs of products and make it accessible to everyone, um, because it's the biggest, one of the biggest issues that I have uh, with people that yeah. I talk to, um, how we reimagine products on, um, Past the, the way that we worked in the past, and we don't continue that addiction to things like, uh, I mean, obvious answers like bar soap and, and um, that right. element, and new systems that break the, the current you. function. Uh, the gentleman in the back, please. Uh, hi, John Twitchin here from uh, Refill here, and I work with various other organizations uh, like uh, GRN Sportswear. Uh, who manufacture products from plastic bottles, sportswear products. Um, my question, I suppose, really is that, you know, are we, are we chasing convenience without really the, the necessary conscience? And Saskia touched on some of this, and one or two others did as well. Um, but it feels to me like making a coffee cup a little bit more recyclable is kind of missing the point, um, and is dismissing the real issue, which is about consumer awareness. Um, and uh, you know, a clear, simple call to action. So whilst the survey might have produced certain results, I think if you'd probably asked people about carrier bags uh, two and a bit years ago, they would have responded in a similar way. So I challenge the, uh, the, 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 the point that you make there, Saskia, um, and to the panel, isn't it really time for a, one of those rather nice, short, sharp shocks that um, changes stuff? And the, thank you very much. And third question for the last one in this round. <laughs> Over here. Uh, thank you. Marek Kowalczyk, University of Wolverhampton and Polish Academy of Science. Uh, my question is to Tony. When you consider polylactate and polyhydroxyalkanoates as materials of hope for the production of compostable bottles, uh, your company is mostly known in Italy for uh, the uh, compostable bags. So my question is, do you see the development of uh, bottles which are compostable also in a portfolio of your industry? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the first question was about the, the higher costs of, of the sort of more 
sustainable packaging. Um, and, uh, and I suspect that Tom, maybe Tom and Pierre will have something to say about uh, that. Yeah, it, yeah it, is a, it is a challenge. Um, costing, especially if you move to new systems, new materials. Uh, one of the issues though is you need plastic um, has become such a commodity, producing such volumes, <laughs> it's just such investments behind it that anything you do that kind of shifts from plastic to something else will cost you more. Um, now the one thing I do see as an opportunity here though is, and I think it, it answers the, the next question as well though, is the whole thing around reusage of materials. If you produce plastic uh, and, and make people excited about reusing that plastic, excited about reusing the container, uh, is it, it, it can be done actually cheaper um, than buying every time a new bottle. So answering that kind of challenge of reuse, and I know indeed it's very tough from a consumer behavior point of view, but again, we haven't really tried to make refill interesting, to make refill excitement uh, exciting. Uh, you might offer people a lot more choice through refill. You might offer them different experience to refill. Um, and that would solve a lot of carbon. It will solve a lot of litter, and it will solve um, the cost issue as well. OK. Um, on, on my perspective is that uh, there's a huge opportunity for being cheaper than plastic, because when you think of like actually all the work that goes into transforming the, like the raw material, that's very like high energy. Obviously, it's got 80 years of R&D, so it's very, very optimized. But I think that uh, we are in a place where there's enormous amount of investment going into new materials, alternatives. So I think there's a big hope for actually putting m m products on the market that are going to be cheaper than plastic, and therefore people just choosing those because they, they will save. And certainly for, in our case, we've always had like the, like the, the objective of providing a cheaper alternative to plastic bottles. So seaweed has like the potential of b being way cheaper than, than plastic. Bill? Yeah, Amelia, you, you'll know this, you work for Greenpeace, but the, the, the Green Party, but the, the whole, um, when you look at the map of the world there and you look at the 8 million tonnes that are winding up in the oceans coming from 10, 10 rivers, the capital costs of getting all of that infrastructure in place, with the exception of China, which could probably yeah. afford to do it. It's just a fallacy to think that that's going to be able to happen any anytime soon. So this is why I think this cost curve abatement approach to understanding how we solve for a billion ton issue and how can we actually have proper side-by-side -side conversations around Bernie said it much more eloquently, actually horses for courses, so that we can actually say when it comes to Vietnam and the Philippines and Cambodia, what can we actually expect them to do based on their existing supply chains um, and being able to actually lay out the cost and, and having a, a way to offset some of that by funding it from developed world solutions. And <clears throat> what I will say is, you know, in terms of legacy from today, I'll work with anybody who's interested in actually pulling together to create that overarching theory of change, to use another Bernice term and say, how, how can we actually fund this and go right to the source on a lot of these issues? Okay. Um, this, do, you, do you want yeah, to come I'll, in? I'll, I'll come in on to add too. Uh, in terms of the costs, um, what we seem to be seem to be forgetting is right now most of the externalities of all of the products that we're talking about are completely ignored. Yeah. So we basically globally, but I know the Commission are looking at it, and even even our wonder people at DEFRA are contemplating it. Is we need a complete reform of EPR, the Extended re Producer Responsibility. We need to look at how the products are being put on the market are actually can fund in <coughs> themselves the systems for collection. There's no money available in many parts of the world for the collection systems and the waste <coughs> management systems. So there should be at least some responsibility of those putting those products onto the market to pay for the establishment of the systems which, which are needed. Um, so not, will, it, will, it a cost, will it increase costs? Yes, but the, the costs right now are, are non-reflective of the actual cost, external cost of what's coming in. In terms of PHA and bottles, it's not something we would be looking at. Um, I can see it working in certain applications um, would it work um, gl uh, globally? Um, I'm not quite sure that the, the composters themselves, they're, they're, they're okay with films and some rigid products. When you start talking to them about bottles today, anyway, they start to get quite worried. Uh, but in terms of specific applications, where, where PHAs are for certainly rigids, I, I, can, I can see it certainly a future. So the, the problem with, um, with the, the pricing and the externalities is just how little actually scientists know about what these externalities are. You know, the, the, when, when you look at the numbers that have been proffered 
for the environmental cost of, of plastic pollution, it's piffling compared to most other types of pollution, right? And, but they, those signs, the people who do try to do this accounting, um, they do concede that there is a lot that we just don't know because we don't know what the effects on ecosystems are of microplastics. I mean, you know, we probably, I probably, you know, I nibble pens. When I nibble pens, I probably consume a fair amount of plastic, um, probably more than I would eating some, you know, mussels um, or, uh, or fish. So, so those are sort of, I think, very, you know, we need to, we probably need to address that as well. There's a scientific gap in understanding what the actual environmental, ecological health effects of plastic pollution are, um, as opposed to sort of assu assuming that it's extremely large and then we should rectify it at any cost. Um, let's go to the, to the last question, uh, or the second question, which was about um, you know, whether, whether we should be nudging people to change or whether we should jolt them into action. Absolutely. Um, I think it's a, a great sort of comparison, convenience versus conscience. Um, and, well, there's a lot to be said here. I think there's a couple of principles I would, I would light on. One is, is I wish we could do a lot more choice editing and, and just sort of not give people the choice because when it comes to convenience, people are willing to pay an awful lot for that convenience. Um, and behaviour change techniques, uh, we can use them for all sorts of things. But when something, you know, if you, if you need a, a, a drink on the go and you buy a pl plastic bottle full of water um, or any other drink, that's convenient. And it, it, changing that would take an absolutely enormous um, sort of social norming and sort of all sorts of infrastructure going on. Um, so I think that's, that's a really tricky one. To, and I agree, in an ideal world, absolutely, we'd sort of change everyone's mindset on this. Um, and programs like Blue Planet are obviously really helping to kind of shift public thinking. Um, the second one is, is the polluter pays principle, which is going back to your point, absolutely. Um, local authorities and budgets are, are tightening. They're struggling to fund their existing system. So it's easy to say, yes, we need more bins. We need more you know, recycling bins on streets. We need better collection. But actually, that's not quite so easy for local authorities who are struggling to, to fund their existing um, commitments. So uh, there's definitely a much bigger problem um, with, uh, with, with kind of who pays for all of this, yeah. um, who's actually willing to put the money in. To, to look at some of these issues. And I think if you kind of solve it from that side, then the problem of, of people and their choices is, is sort of slightly reduced and, and taken out of the equation somewhat. But people certainly respond to incentives. I mean, when the, when the 5p uh, charge for plastic bags was introduced, the use fell by something like 85%? If I remember yeah, and, that, and that's where the, the whole latte levy idea came from, was this sort of principle that it could really work. And there's you know, we're looking at it at the moment and, and doing some research right at the moment to see, <coughs> will it persuade people? Um, the problem, I suppose, is that you know, if you go and buy a few items and you forget your, your cloth bag, you can just carry those items away with you. You can't sort of go to the coffee person and say, no, I don't want to dispose of one. I'll just sort of have it in my hand. Well, you just have to have the disposable and, cup. And, and alternatively, you also don't want to accumulate all these tote bags because the, the carbon footprint of a, well, of a tote bag, I found out, is 131 uh, times higher than that of a plastic bag. So you, you need, need to use it 131 times. You need times. to use it 131 yes. times before the, the, yeah. the carbon footprint is improved. Yeah. Um, and then if I go to a shop, forgot mine, and buy a new one, that's 262. Um, exactly. how, how many people have an accumulating pile of tote bags at home? Yes. Um, quite, so quite. alternatives need to be thought about. Bernice? Well, sorry, I was raising my hand about the tote bag guilt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, 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 but I also want to ask, uh, maybe the audience will have some reflections as well. I mean, we can nudge, and, and in some ways, the plastic bag one became regulation. It wasn't just nudge, and, and we kind of nudge enough so that you know, people kind of fall over on the other side. And some cities have indeed singled a particular kind of plastic for banning. Yeah. So I just wonder whether or not we can get some views on you know, where we are, given the public anger, given you know, the, 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 the big mo at the moment. You know, how likely are we going to tip over, or are we just going to sit back here in a year's time? Oops, we're still where we were. Um, do we have some more questions from the floor? Uh, the gentleman in the fourth row here. I'm Ugar Kalic, member and freelance marketing consultant. My question is how the petrol companies and the companies who are using the plastic bottles are responding to this, like the fizzy drink companies? Mm -hmm. uh, we have the gentleman in the back with the beard. So uh, David Wilson, Imperial College and President of CRWM, the professional body for the waste and resource sector. 
Um, Niall made a point that we need good data similar to that underpinning climate. And when it comes to plastics leaking to the ocean, by definition, it's difficult to measure. So we've got two modeling studies that we rely on and they are being misquoted in this meeting and my blood is beginning to boil. <laughs> uh, we have one study by Jambak et al, which estimated the quantities of mismanaged plastic solid waste in coastal areas 50 kilometers from the coast entering the ocean. And they came up with a median figure of 8 million tons a year. We then had Leverton et al from the Helmholtz Center who said coastal areas aren't everything, we need to look at rivers. So they used the Jamback model and data, they looked at rivers, and they came up with an incremental um, addition of another two million tons a year. So that's 10 million in total. The abstract from that second study uh, if has a sentence that says, 90% of the global load, by which they meant the incremental two million tons, comes from just 10 rivers in Asia and Africa. And Jan, last week in The Economist, the data we had here uh, today from the Chatham House, Niall, in your uh, answer to the last question, which is why I stood up, uh, you all quoted 90% of the total comes from just 10 rivers. It's 90% of the 20%, which is 18%, comes from 10 rivers. And please, we have very little data. We rely on two modeling studies. Can we, as, quote, experts, please quote the right figures? And if I could ask journalists, please actually read the article rather than going to the abstract, or worse, quoting another journalist who was too lazy to go and read the full thing. <laughs> Thank you. And the gentleman at the front. Thank you. Sophia? Yep, Mark. Yeah. I thought with the petrochemical question. No, 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 it's a, a very basic. Thank you. But it actually follows on a bit from the last question. Right? And my name's Mark Moody Stewart. I'm an old oil and gas and, and petrochemical man. Uh, the, uh, the, the whole drive for this came from Blue Planet and, and, and waste going into the sea. And it seems to me, while I applaud all that you're doing, and that obviously is the longer term solution, there is a concern just about the stuff that doesn't go where it ought to go. If I walk down our lane in the country, every three months I can pick up a sack of plastic. You can measure the size of the McDonald's packet uh, down the lane by the distance from the McDonald's outfit. The family packs are at the far end. Uh, and likewise, if you visit tropical countries and look in the storm drains, it's full of plastic. Uh, and that's the stuff, it seems to me, which ultimately, through rivers, streams, and so on, gets into the sea. And it, there must be something we could collectively do to address that. I don't know what it is through education, but uh, we've got to do it, otherwise it's, uh, the mess will get greater. So let's have one more question. Thank you, uh, Jan. David Newman, BBIA. We're the association in the UK which represents the bioplastics producers. Um, you said uh, in your article in The Economist about the, the cost of plastic pollution. The World Bank in 2012 stated that the cost of getting collection systems in place in developing countries across the world was about 30 billion a year. And the International Solid Waste Association uh, three years ago estimated that it was actually about 60 billion a year. Now that really is, excuse the pun, a drop in the ocean uh, compared to the environmental damage that plastics are doing. And it comes back to Tony's point about the externalities not being priced in. And, and, and it's all about money. So, as you say, the plastics are not are ending up in the drains in, in, in third world countries is because they don't have the finance to do that. So, the International Solid Waste Association called upon governments to dedicate a part of their overseas aid to those waste management Absolutely. systems in developing countries. That's the way to go. Yeah. 
but that's pretty much what we said in our leader. Um, okay, uh, so we had, we basically had uh, several comments and, and one question. Um, the question was about uh, what do uh, petroleum companies and packaging companies make of all this? I mean, do they, are they keen? Are they not keen? <laughs> Rhetorical question. Neil? Mar Mark, is it Mark? Mark, you, you made a point about the blue planet and how that's kind of captured the, the public mindset first. And I think the reason that was so effective was because um, people see it everywhere. Kids, you know, I live in Buckinghamshire and, and they, they will go out and they'll bring it back and, and recycle it themselves. If you go for a cycle or a run, looking at the roadside verges in this country, the A roads and the B roads, there's a whole epidemic here right on our doorstep. It doesn't take the blue planet to actually activate us around. And the issue is that's fugitive plastic. And that's why biodegradate, bio, <laughs> I'm going to say it again, um, but h helping it to biodegrade is incredibly important, that we actually design polymers so that when they do wind up on those roadside verges, that nature can properly deal with it. We shouldn't be encouraging littering. We should be dealing with littering. We should be using nudge theory and everything we know about behavior change. I mean, if we can get the kind of political and election results through gaming um, the whole electoral system, surely we can nudge people towards the right sustainable choices, but assuming that the system at some point in time leaks and things wind up in those roadside verges, not just in the oceans, we should make, we should make it so that nature is able to deal with it. And the good news on that front is that it is cost effective. Uh, do you have any, any yeah. response to the question about um, uh, what do the, either the producers of divergent stuff or the people who use plastics, like packages, make yeah, of it? I can, I can sure. that. Uh, from a um, working with the packaging industry, the packaging industry essentially will do what they're told. So the brands, the brands, the retailers, and everyone will say, I want a package to do this. So if you, if, if, um, do we have anyone if, if from I'm not packaging right, industry here? If I'm, if I'm not, so they, well, they will try and do what they will do what they're told. They'll push back on price or they'll push back on this. So if the if the if the, the, the brand owners and the people putting the products into the market wanted something different, they could certainly push it. Um, in terms of working with the resin the resin guys and the polymer producers, um, I've made the point. We start as a company. We started as a research part from Montedison, who are one of the biggest petrochemical industries within Italy. We are now working uh, with ENI in Italy to reconvert or convert one of their, their um, petrochemical facilities on in Sardinia. So th there's interest, will they shift overnight? No, because their vested interest for the next 30 years is in, in, their, in their oil fields, but they know change is coming. Uh, could I just get a response from the packaging industry? Will you do what you're told? I've got two hats. My day job, I'm in the packaging industry. So in my day job, I work in the packaging industry. We design packaging for the biggest corporates in the world. And we have people like Nestle, Unilever, Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera, as clients. My nighttime job is working for Plastic Planet, which um, sort of is not terribly keen on petrochemicals. Um, and we introduced our first plastic free aisle last week. So I have a kind of dual kind of <laughs> role. I would say that the, the package, you're absolutely right. The retailers will do what customers want what their consumers ask for, and the packaging manufacturers and the, pack and the brands will do whatever the retailers want, which is why we've been talking to retailers that are at the top of the chain worldwide. Um, I'd also sort of say that the, the Shells and the BPs of this world, uh, you, you would have seen BP saying, this is going to affect oil, but we're looking at a non-petrochem transportation system, we're looking at a whole pile of things happening in the future where carbon footprint will change because we'll be looking at tidal, wind, whatever kind of power. The whole carbon footprint equations have to change. But I'd like to ask a question, which is around beverages. I'll focus on that, about plastic bottles. Do we really need to invent new stuff when we've got glass? <laughs> because there are many countries in the world who haven't moved from glass. Poland, beer, Mexico, beer, billions and billions of bottles, and then aluminium. 200 billion units of aluminium packaging, infinitely recyclable, PET 11 times, then landfill. That's my question. Do we need new materials, or can we stick with paper, aluminium, glass that actually we didn't have a plastic ocean in the 70s and 80s when I was a kid? 
Uh, Pierre? Yeah. I would just add two thoughts on this. I think that there's a lot of uh, valid points. Just uh, looking at the whole picture, thinking of glass, it's a very heavy material. Yeah. So the actual hidden cost of using glass, which is like completely bio-benign and has no like negative impact on the environment, is that you need to have a lot more petrol in your trucks. So the actual cost is, uh, is, is, is there. And I think what's really interesting to think of is um, actually, there's a there's a lot of uh, like uh, cost in uh, in like plastic that will disrupt all of the actors in in the industry, and and all of these need to be accounted for. Um, and, and the other thought that I had was uh, that thing like the the initial question, which was how do uh, the packaging industry react or the beverage industry react? And I think that's one question, which is what is the margin in those businesses. And I think the margin is taking a very, very cheap product, putting it into a bottle, and making it a much more expensive product. Are those businesses ready to, but to sell in bulk their products without those high margins? Because it's all about like making a single serving and taking the, 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 the margin from that. So I think that there is a lot of vested interest in those businesses to keep that, that same model. Um, I think we probably don't have time for another question. We'll go to... Uh, Shelley, do you want to, do you mind waiting five minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we, we might have a, a couple more. Uh, the lady here in the blue jumper. Hi, I'm oh. Harriet Howie. I'm from Diageo. Um, I have a question. Um, a lot of our senior leaders and our employees care very deeply about this issue. But um, as with any complex systemic problem, um, it's a struggle to know where exactly to focus our resources. So a question for any or all of the panel, what, where would you suggest we focus our resources or we advise our senior leaders to mobilize their teams and their expertise? Thank you. And, and the second lady here in the third row. Thank you. My name's Julia Hunt. I'm from the marine litter team at DEFRA. Uh, I think all of us are agreeing that there's no one solution to the plastic uh, pollution problem, so we'll need to take several different approaches, including reduce, reuse, recycle, different innovative materials, different behaviours, and so on. Um, on the point of the biodegradable materials, obviously they're an important aspect to addressing pol uh, plastics pollution. However, they come with a couple of problems as well. One is that um, if you've got a biodegradable plastic bag in the marine environment and it breaks down vastly quicker than a non-biodegradable one, uh, it's still going to be potentially swallowed by a whole bunch of turtles before it breaks down. Um, and that the, the fact the public know that a product is biodegradable has tended to make, mean that they're more likely to litter. Um, and equally, they're more likely to litter the biodegradable things because they don't think it matters, but that produces a society where they, people see litter and think it's all right to litter things that might not be biodegradable. And that means, firstly, how do we make public behavior address that so that there isn't littering? And secondly, if there is going to be, how do we deal with uh, extended producer responsibility? Because the stuff that's being littered um, isn't necessarily, it may be being littered because biodegradable um, products that those companies look like they're doing something good, but they may be encouraging other products that weren't previously littered to be littered. Uh, and one more maybe on that side over there. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Can we say a roll, you know, quickly, yeah. like 30 seconds each, but then we go to our deputy mayor, and then we have everybody answering at the end, picking the right question, so that we don't answer one by okay. one, so that we get more views from the room. Can we do that? Sure. Uh, the lady in the here yeah, in the sixth row. Hello. So uh, my name's Nicola Everett from the University of Nottingham, and I'm a materials scientist. So I'm one of the people who'd like to work on new materials. So uh, bravo for eating the bottle. I think that was great. Just to say about terminology, when we everyone's talking about polymers as if the only polymers come from oil, and actually cellulose and chitin are natural biopolymers, and they can do many of the good things that the oil-based polymers do, and you can possibly tune 
the biodegradability. So I, working on a project funded by the Newton Institute with Egypt, trying to make degradable packaging from the chitin in shrimp shell. So that's trying to use a waste product to produce a package that will degrade. And I think we need to be innovative in our approaches. But so the question was, what about the other polymers, cellulose and, and chitin? Okay, some more. The gentleman in behind the lady. Yep, one of them, or both. Yeah, I'll go first. Hi, my name's Mike Webster from Waste Aid UK. We work in parts of the world without formal waste collection. A third of the world's population don't have their waste collected. We've seen a massive, massive shift in places like West Africa from uh, reusable glass bottles with a deposit on 10, 20 years ago to single-use PET bottles. Uh, what should we do about it? Thank you. Uh, Costas Vallis is University of Leeds and uh, here in my capacity also as uh, chair of the International uh, Solid Waste Association Task Force on Marine Litter. I think, as, as has been pointed a few times now, but not uh, uh, clearly, the, the big problem, the fundamental problem, is the part of the world well, the, these items, the plastic bottle, is becoming waste and it's not managed, it's not collected, ending up in the water bodies. Now, the interesting thing is that we have consumption patterns there, and we have needs that are similar or even exceeding our needs uh, uh, for, for water supply and secure and clean water supply. And I think there are fundamental reasons for convenience and functionality behind the success of the materials. So if we don't provide equivalent solution to those, no matter what we do, we will fail. And if we don't provide solutions on the waste collection and processing and resource recovery to those people, we will again fail. And maybe we are concerned that the things we're experiencing, all of us, each of us in the street, here, there, but there is where the fundamental problem on a global scale uh, lies, and maybe we have to think about it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay, so uh, we'll thank you very much for, uh, for all those very interesting questions. We will uh, we'll now hand over to, uh, to Shirley Rodriguez, who's the Deputy Mayor of London for Environment and Energy. Shirley. Thanks, Bernice, and to Chatham House uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak at the reception. And I know that you've had a really great discussion. I'm sorry I, I wasn't able to be part of the, the um, seminar this afternoon. Um, so I don't want to hold you uh, from having your drinks. But I'm just going to say just a few words about what we're doing in London. Um, and just listening to the comments just then, uh, you know, many of the themes I was going to just touch on, uh, uh, you've already um, mentioned. Um, and first of all, I really don't think it's been a, uh, there's been a more exciting time to be involved in uh, the waste and resources agenda than now. We have been working in London on the circular economy for some time, um, but single-use plastic bottles, plastics, uh, generally deposit return schemes have really risen to the fore. Um, and issues um, that have been raised by campaigners, but also Sir David Attenborough's Blue Planet, have really um, have really raised the issue, and, and we have a zeitgeist moment that, that we're really trying to ride in London on how we can tackle uh, plastics, capturing that public opinion about, uh, about plastics, and the destruction that they cause in our oceans. Um, so, uh, pardon the pun, but we, it does feel like we're at a sea change moment uh, with a lot of public momentum behind it, and if we can harness that momentum, not just on plastics, we think there's a real potential to revolution, revolutionize how we use resources more broadly. So in London, we want to be at the cutting edge of these new approaches and the development of a more circular economy. Um, and there's a very clear reason to do this, basically the economy uh, for London. We estimate the potential to be up to uh, £7 billion annually going into the London economy by 2036. Um, but really, we know a lot more needs to happen. We estimate that we're still buying in London something in the order of 1.2 billion single-use plastic water bottles every year. Our recycling rate uh, for household waste in London is only 33%. So we're not capturing all the materials that we can for recycling. And worryingly, we think 10% of all litter found in the Thames is plastic bottles and their lids. And 47% of those are single-use plastic bottles. So in London, um, we are uh, already working and want to take the lead on working with industry, consumers, and local authorities to turn around those really unimpressive figures. 
So what are we doing in London? Well, first of all, we're setting the policy framework to create the environment for boroughs, businesses, and others to cut waste and plastics and innovate new ways of keeping resources in circulation longer. The mayor published his draft London Environment Strategy last August, which set out a whole number of policies on how to make London more sustainable, from making London a zero carbon city by 2050, um, putting London on track to recycle 65% of its waste by 2030, uh, and, uh, and another, uh, a number of other targets. Um, in particular on waste, we've identified um, packaging and food waste as an area that we want to, to focus on. And we've adopted the, uh, or proposing to adopt the Courtauld commitment, I think, um, um, target of reducing uh, packaging waste throughout the value chain by 20% by 2025. And at the moment, what we're looking at is the consultation responses to see uh, whether there's support to go further and faster. In the light of a lack of a government framework or even solid commitments to action, we believe that policy framework is providing the certainty and the long-term signal that uh, those businesses and consumers need in London. Uh, the mayor is also putting some money uh, uh, behind this agenda. We've announced plans to pilot a London refill scheme because we know that a, a number of uh, single-use plastics are used when people are about uh, out and about, traveling long distances, commuting, seeing London sites. But there are very few places that people can refill reusable water bottles when they're on the go. So there's little option but to buy a single-use uh, single water bottle. Um, the proposal is we're going to trial a water refill scheme in five locations in London, where businesses will offer free tap water to Londoners, and the plan is to roll that out across London if those pilots are successful. We've also announced uh, funding uh, around three million pounds to cut plastic waste and roll out water fountains in strategic locations across the capital. We hope that this will significantly reduce the amount of single-use plastic bottles that we use in the first place and that escape into our rivers and seas. But that's uh, only really the tip of what's possible and indeed what we need to do. Um, we want the government to go much further, um, and I'd like to add some ideas to DEFRA's increasingly long list of things it's considering on consulting, which I hope are food for thought um, for, for DEFRA, but also for some of you here today. Um, just a couple of things just before I end. One is we should be considering setting minimum standards of design for reuse and recyclability. Too many of our products aren't designed to be repaired or recycled, and in many cases they simply aren't durable enough. Uh, and the other issues, we believe DEFRA should also consider extending the producer responsibility to fast-moving consumer goods and consider, a, a, in effect, a plastics obligation requiring a, a, minimal, a minimum level of recycled content to really drive markets for recycled material and help sustain uh, this industry. Um, we're doing a lot more on innovation, encouraging our entrepreneurs to come up with new and innovative ideas um, to, to provide alternatives that uh, will contribute to the low carbon and circular economy through the Mayor's Entrepreneur Scheme. Um, so those are just a few areas that we're working on. And then finally, we are setting for local authorities in London a requirement that they um, collect food waste separately uh, from now on and collect six materials, the standard six materials, um, both from curbside properties and we're thinking now also extending it to flatted properties, although that's obviously much diff more difficult in London. And in this way, we hope to drive up the recycling. But the first, uh, the first um, focus for, for the mayor's strategy is about reduction. We need to reduce the amount of resources that we're using, use them more efficiently, then recycle, um, and so on. So thank you very much for just giving me a little bit of time to tell you what we're doing in London. Um, and on behalf of the mayor in London, thank you for your involvement today. Thank you. Yeah, fine. Uh, so, we, uh, does the panel have any questions for the deputy mayor? Yes. The pan yeah. the pan does the panel have any questions first? Yeah. Just yeah. Um, my question is, how do you think London can become an example for the rest of the world or the rest of like Europe or wherever? And um, and do you think that this is something that is uh, an objective at the moment? To, to kind of like show that things are possible to implement in a city scale and then like reproduce them elsewhere? Okay, and, and Absolutely, yeah. Uh, let's have another mm -hmm. one very quickly. Yes. So why hasn't London done anything about VW cheating on emissions? <laughs> 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 
Well, we have a colleague from DEFRA, probably the wrong division, but we can probably say as much as I can. Um, I'll start with, uh, can London be an exemplar? Um, we, we absolutely aim to be an exemplar among, uh, among other cities. Uh, we're part of, we, in fact, we established the C40 cities in London uh, several years ago, which is now um, really a best practice network and a peer benchmarking network for cities. And we all do slightly different things, but one of the big issues for us is air quality um, and climate change. So we do, look, we do a lot anyway in London about piloting um, projects to then see if we can scale them up. We're doing a number of things on climate change, for example, looking at energy efficiency of, of of housing, a very deep retrofit, which is something that, that the Dutch have tried, but we're trying to do much more of in London to see whether it works here. Um, the big problem is that the, the mayor's powers, uh, as, as uh, it's the problem with many other mayors across the world, that the, the, the powers that the mayors have vary um, from city to city. So the ability for us to take action uh, is hampered somewhat. So whilst we have very strong powers on transportation and can take a lot of action on, on for example, uh, vehicle emissions, on air quality um, and driving electrification of vehicles or public transportation, the mayor has a, um, um, an ambition for or a target for 80% of all um, trips in London to be on public or active transportation, cycling and walking. Um, we don't have powers in other areas. So on energy efficiency in buildings, uh, unlike New York, we have very little power. So all we can do is do voluntary schemes, um, try and encourage government to take the, or to give us the powers to take the mandatory action that we need. You've probably seen some of the work, uh, the publications recently about, um, about um, uh, our, our pitiful state of energy efficiency, which is impacting on fuel poverty. Uh, in London. So I think that's absolutely what we want to do. I think, you know, the plastic bottles work that we're doing uh, is, is one example of that. Um, taking um, ideas from other cities or, or businesses and just trying to trial them and roll them out, show them as opportunities for government to, 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 to put into policy. Um, on VW, we it's, we don't have the powers. We've written to VW. We've, the, the mayor's called uh, the VW uh, UK in to have that conversation. But really, it li that, that um, um, ability to, to hold VW to account lies with, with the government. Um, unlike, uh, our US, uh, 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 unlike the US, we've not been able to secure the, the level of compensation um, that they have for, for a number of reasons, but we think they could have gone much further and much faster than they have done. Um, the mayor has asked for, for example, a diesel scrappage fund. He's asked um, government to help pay for that because uh, the, the manufacturers clearly aren't, aren't going to. Um, we're still waiting for that. And in fact, the funding that's been available, been made available to the rest of the country on uh, tackling air quality, Londoners, even though they are paying into that fund through their taxes and through their VAT have been excluded, even though I think we have about 40% of the, the road kilometers in the country, 40% of the problem. So that's obviously an active area of lobbying that the, uh, that the mayor is, is um, undertaking. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you very much. I, uh, I would like to ask just one, one last question, that was a, which, which came from the lady from Giagio, um, which sort of is directed at the entire panel, including the deputy mayor, and that's about where, to, where do companies within the plastics value chain focus, focus their attention? Uh, because they're, I mean, drinks makers and other, they're pestered by all manner of environmental campaigners. And the plastics, uh, the ones dealing with plastics are obviously you know, very well represented here, I suspect. Um, but, uh, but there are also others who look at water, others who look at air, or others who look at all manner, all, all other types of, of, of pollution. And, um, and it, what's, how, how, do, how do we pick between which actions should we pursue with limited resources? This is a broad question. You know, all entities within the economy have limited resources. Um, where do we channel that attention? Where do we channel those resources? Uh, where can they be leveraged uh, most effectively? Yeah. Yeah. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> Is I would say you can't. You have to do the analysis. You know the reason why we've ended up with a VW situation is because we plumped for carbon emissions without really thinking about, uh, you know, the, the 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 unintended consequences. So companies, businesses, bars, you have to do the analysis and work out the best way that that, that helps mitigate that. You know where you target resources, you have to look at where you get the biggest bang for buck, I guess. You know, uh, and prioritise. But you can't pick a single issue, a single winner, because you'll cause a problem elsewhere. Tom. 20 seconds. Um, I, I do believe companies can do now already a lot uh, that they're not doing, which is creating supply and demand 
creating packaging which is recyclable, creating uh, and just integrating more recycled content into the packaging. It's on the market, it's available, you can use it, it's food grade. Um, so, so why don't we see much more recycled content available? And then I think on a longer term, I think they do need to work on that longer term track of designing plastic out of their business model, even if it's just for, even if it's just for kind of the learning from, from what it could do to your business model. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, a lot of people said that like there's no one solution fits all. So be ready to look at things individually. Every case is different. And I would say pass the ball. There's there's lots of people trying to do something. Let's let's have that uh, work uh, done collectively. And I think that it's not going to be uh, solved by having like someone asking for something and someone delivering that. My thing I would be, if I was Diageo, I would, I would stop pushing back uh, uh, with all brands on uh, EPR reform globally and accept that there is some EPR that needs to be put in, in complete reform globally, not just in what we're doing in, in the UK. And m message to the lady from DEFRA, I don't know where you've got the uh, biodegradable means littering from. I think it might be Chinese whispers that David's talking about. But it, it might be easier if you would go along the lines of banning biodegradable as a term and just being pushing the word compostable so the cons and making food waste mandatory. That would make everybody's life a lot simpler. Neil? Well, um, I didn't catch your name, sorry. Julia. Julia. So, Julia, I think the, the whole concept of a circular economy is fantastic to the point at which it, it starts to leak back into the natural environment. So the PET bottle that becomes a PET bottle again, maybe again, then it would probably be designed, loomed into apparel, so into textiles and worn as a garment. But at some point in time, that's going to wind up in landfill or back in the natural environment. And I think that's the thing that we need to design for. Um, so that's why, why biodegradation is so incredibly important, that we can actually think about that. Um, I'm not... Um, old enough to remember the time that seatbelts weren't actually uh, mandatory in cars, but I did read up on the, the debate at the time around if we put seatbelts in cars, everybody's going to be driving at 100 miles an hour, people are just going to be head on into each other, why would you possibly do that? It'll be carnage. It didn't happen. Well, what it did because because it allowed you it allowed you to have a conversation about safety that just wasn't being had at that moment in time. So I do think that if you market and communicate it properly, it can encourage the right behaviors. There was actually a study, there, there were studies which showed that people, there, there are more accidents involving pedestrians. There are fewer accidents w w in which drivers were hurt, more, more accidents in which pedestrians were hurt after the introduction of seatbelts. That's seat why belts. you need full life cycle analysis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Saskia. Yeah, absolutely agree with the full life cycle analysis, <laughs> but including how people actually use things in the real world, um, that, that's often a bit that I think can be, can be forgotten. So what, how can people actually uh, use it? Uh, quick wins as well, keeping everyone happy, you know, sort of keeping motivation going by, by just sort of getting some quick wins in there. And in terms of littering and behaviour change, which I think was, was another kind of uh, comment you made, um, that's so often a social issue as well as an environmental one, and it's to do with, with so many things beside people just dropping rubbish. It's about how people feel about an area um, and so many other factors as well. Um, there's no kind of one uh, sort of silver bullet, um, but there are also a huge number of people doing great things on littering, and it does also go back to the whole infrastructure thing and who's paying for it, um, back to polluter pays, I think. So, and I'll take the last 20 seconds just to wrap up our, our very interesting discussion. Um, uh, basically, it, it seems that when we talk about reinventing the plastic bottle, we really shouldn't be focusing on the product, on the, on the item, on the bottle. We really need to reinvent not just the bottle itself, although, you know, as we heard, there are some very intriguing and, and innovative ideas about how to do that. We also need to try and start thinking very carefully about to, how to redesign um, the entire plastics value, value chain but also the system which will try to repurpose some of what it currently becomes waste as a resource. And um, that may sound trite, but it's, uh, but it's certainly something extremely important. And, and if the plastics problem is to be solved, uh, we need to look actually outside of London, Britain, the West. We need to look, uh, we need to look sort of over there um, and, uh, and over there. Um, in, in Asia and Africa um, and help those countries develop 
uh, waste collection systems, either through lending expertise or indeed providing resources. Uh, and that will be of great benefit, and not just in, in terms of plastic pollution, but in terms of all other types of waste and uh, externalities with which people living in those countries currently have to contend, um, and without which their lives will be much better. So thank you very much uh, to all of you gathered here, to, to all our panelists for this really interesting discussion. Re reception and, and art exhibition upstairs. And, and we invite you all to a, to a, for, for, for a glass of, of something or other, a plastic or glass. <laughs> well, more <laughs> it take a while, guess. Uh, but we also have an exhibition, Sophie Thomas exhibition we, yes. upstairs, which is beautiful, where we will have drinks. So. Thank you very much.